back. I'm Pastor Tiffany. My husband, Pastor Elliot, was up here. Normally, when, when, I, uh, when he does worship, he's smashing on the drums, and I get to say that. But today, he wasn't smashing on the drums. He was leading from the guitar, and that's great, too. <laughs> Uh, we love being the pastors here at Lifeline. And last week, actually, I was um, out of town. I, we were with, I was with 14 other ladies from Lifeline. We went up to Old Oak Ranch for the women's retreat. And I just have to tell you that we had an amazing time. It was so much fun. And not only was it so much fun, but every single lady who went up to women's camp on Sunday morning, we had a chance to, to talk to each other, and every single lady was ministered to by Jesus. They heard a word specifically for their situation or for their future. And can I tell you that God is good? God is so good. And so we were happy to be doing that uh, last week. Um, and guys, here at Lifeline Church, we have a mission. Do you guys know what the mission is? If you know what the mission is, go ahead and say it with me. It's to be a lifeline. That's right. And we do that by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. And so I, you know, every time I get up here, I say the same thing. But that means in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, we're loving and serving Jesus everywhere we go. And we're learning how in the world we serve Jesus through tough situations and through good situations and letting Jesus really be uh, the definer of our life. And that's, that's our mission here at the church. Um, we're in the third week of a series called Don't Quit in the Dip. <laughs> it's been a great series. So this is week three. And there, uh, we've had a saying. So if you've been with us for this series, you could probably say this with me. But if you're not dead, then God's not done. That's right. If you're not dead, God's not done. And today what we're going to be talking about is the secret sauce. Uh, there's secret sauce uh, that we get to find out in the dip. I, you guys know that there's illustrations because they're on either side of me. There's a lot happening today. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is <clears throat> secret sauce. And the secret sauce is knowing the benefit of tests. If you guys are taking notes, you can follow along with us on the YouVersion Bible app. We've made that available. And if you didn't get, uh, if you would prefer paper, we have paper fill in the blanks in the back along with mini clipboards. So you're free to, if you didn't get one, you can go grab one. Totally, it's fine to get up, walk back there, get it, and bring it back. Uh, so we're talking secret sauce, and we're, what we're talking about is knowing the benefit of tests. You guys remember tests in like high school, junior high, college, whatever? Remember tests? Okay, I, <laughs> boo, uh, some of you guys were, were great test, test, test takers, so it didn't matter if you studied or not, if it was a surprise test or not, you were able to walk in and just ace that test. You know, you're the person who kind of messed up the curve for everybody else, because nobody else knew the test was coming, and you somehow got all the answers right. Or maybe you're the person who was like, okay, great. Uh, you know, you're taking the test, and the teacher says, put your pencil down, and you've still got like, you know, 30 unanswered questions. You're like, oh, well, that, that's it. That's what, that's what we did today. Uh, <laughs> this is what I know. Um, tests. Not all of us. Actually, we, there was just a test on Wednesday night at our equip class, the Operation in Solid Lives. That's the only equip class that has tests. And if you make it through that class, you're diehard because it's boot camp. So boop, boop. Um, but there's a test in that class. And one of the, the people were like, oh, I'm so excited for the test. Like, they couldn't wait for it. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Um, so there's those kind of tests. But then what about these other kind of tests when uh, like someone's kind of grading up against you like emotionally or relationally and you're like, you know, don't push my buttons. Have you ever, have, how many of you ever said, don't test me? 
<laughs> don't you dare test me. Don't you push me to my limit. That's kind of what we're saying, right? Don't. Ugh. A lot of us do it with our kids or with our spouses, uh, sometimes with a coworker or boss. D don't. Don't you test me. Uh, unfortunately, I think what a lot of times we do is we turn around and we apply that same thinking to our creator. Have, have, have you guys ever felt like, God, don't you test me? <laughs> don't you push me to my limit, God? I, I'm at my limit. I can't take any more. Don't you push me. Don't you test me. Um, the Bible talks about, so we're going to talk about is the benefit of tests because the Bible talks about tests as a proving ground, um, as a place where God gets us ready for what's next, what he wants to do with us next. And so today I want to help us get ready because if we stay ready or if we are ready, we don't have to get ready. We're going to stay ready. So I want to teach you the benefit. And guys, a lot of people do crazy things for, how many has ever been on a diet? Because the benefit is you look good or you feel good or whatever. We do a lot of crazy things for a benefit. We've, we've got a guy around here. You, might, you may have met him before. He loves his green drinks. And every time we ask him what's in it, he'll tell us and we'll say, how does it taste? And he's like, uh. Like every once in a while it tastes good, but most of the time he says, ah, it doesn't taste that great. And I'm like, wah, ah. But he drinks it. It's, he's like faithful to drink it. Why? Because of the benefit. There's health benefits. Uh, people go to the gym and they work out real hard. Most of the time at the beginning, at least for the first month, anybody who's going to be a diehard gym person doesn't really like it in the beginning. You got to press through. Once you see the benefit, then you have the strength to keep going. But until you get that benefit, it's like, whoo, that's real. That's just hard work. But we do it. We do crazy things for benefits. Um, so today we're going to look at the, our first scripture we're going to look at is in James. James is the half-brother of Jesus. And now when James was walking on the earth, not James. When Jesus was walking on the earth, James didn't actually believe in Jesus as the Savior. But as he watched Jesus and began to see what was happening with his half-brother, which is crazy. Can you imagine trying to convince your brothers and sisters that you're the Savior of the world? <laughs> Like, just think Joseph. You know, that didn't go over. You will all bow down to me. It didn't go very well. Jesus took a different approach. He didn't say you're all going to bow down to me, although he could have. Uh, but anyway, eventually, James did come to see his half-brother as the true Savior of the world, as the Son of God. And what James, who James is writing to, James writes a letter in the New Testament, and he's writing to the 12 tribes of Israel who are, you know, thousands of people, millions of people, and they're scattered across the nations. Now, these weren't, the people he's writing to aren't Christians who were taking a break, but they were refugees because of their faith. They had fled and they were refugees because of their faith. And so this is who James is writing to. So they're wandering, they're living in caves. Guys, they don't have DoorDash, so they can't just, you know, get their food delivered. They don't have any Wi-Fi, so they can't just stay connected through social media. Like they're refugees alone and they're separated from their people. And then James writes to them. <clears throat> so think about how excited they may have been to get a letter from James, the half-brother of Jesus. They're, and it's, okay, today it's email. They're, they're so excited. They open up their phone that they don't have, and they see James's name. And so they're so excited to open it because they're like, man, if James is writing us, he's got good news. He's going to tell us the war is over. It is safe. You can come home now. You can come out of those caves. Uh, the persecution has died down. Like they're, you know, imagine before they open the letter how much excitement they they must feel. And then they open up the letter and they see the first line. It's James 2, 1 through 4. And it says this, James 1, 2 and 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Someone immediately said, this is spam. Someone hacked into James' email account and oh, they're playing tricks on us. This can't be right. <clears throat> consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. He's writing to refugees. He didn't say consider it pure happiness because feelings are fickle. There's, there's a saying we have around here. It's we choose joy. Someone said this morning, it's one of our It's their favorite value here at Lifeline, but it's one of the hardest because we have to choose it. We choose joy. So he's not talking about happiness. He's talking about joy. Uh, th let's think about happiness. You're so happy that someone showed up to work with donuts <laughs> and then you're mad because you ate five instead of one. 
<laughs> or you're sad. Uh, let, let's think about this. You're so happy that you get to go shopping. You're like, yes, I get to go shopping. And then you're so sad because it didn't come in your size or your color. Happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. Feelings are fickle, but joy is something we choose. No matter the, the situation, I'm going to choose joy. We like to say it like this. I'm going to find something to celebrate in every situation. So the whole situation might not be good, but there's probably something I can celebrate. There's hope I can hang on to, and that's joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Um, okay, and then he keeps, let's keep going. It says, when, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know... If you have your Bible, I want you to underline that word, no, because you know. That's what I want to focus on, because James is expecting us to know something. So the question is, what are you expecting us to know? He's, let's keep going. Because you know that the testing, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. He wants them to know. He wants us to know that the testing we experience is doing a job. The testing is doing a job. It's working something out. Verse 4, it says, let perseverance finish its work. Let's stop right there. I wonder how many people never make it to their destiny because they don't let God finish. In the testing of their faith, the faith that produces perseverance, when perseverance finishes its work, how many people never get to their destiny because they drop out when the testing gets tough? Keep going. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How many of you guys want to be mature? Yes, I'm an adult. I want to be a mature adult. <laughs> Not just a mature adult, but I want to be mature in my faith. I want to know some things. I want to be mature. How many of you guys want to be complete? Have a sense of wholeness and fullness and completeness. Lacking nothing. How many of you guys want to know what it's like to not experience lack at all? Because you know some things. Amen. That doesn't happen without a test. It doesn't happen without a test. Um, let's think of it this way. I love the idea. I've never been to Maui, <clears throat> but in my brain, in my brain, I love the idea of vacationing in Maui with my family on the beach. It'd be amazing. You know what I don't love? The process. <laughs> to get to Maui with my family. You know what I got to do? I got to make a plan. I got to sacrifice money to purchase those airline tickets. I got to take my family on the airplane. I got to get to the airport. I got to park. I got to take the shuttle. I have to wait. I have to be crammed in the tiny thing. And then I got to lose because you travel backwards in time. So you got to lose some hours of sleep. And then everybody's discombobulated and hungry and weird. There's a test. You know, there's a test to get from where I am to where I want to be, okay? And how many of us, maybe we, we have the dream, but we don't ever make it happen because of the process. That, that process is too much. So I'll, I'll let that dream be the dream, but I'll never, I'll never see it come to pass. I'll never walk into fulfillment with it. Um, a lot of us want the benefit of a mature faith, but do we, the question is, do we see the tests as a pathway? to that mature faith that, that we want. I want us to see the benefit of tests. I want you to get to the place where you can say, bring the heat. That's, that's what I want to get us to say. So think about, the, let's, let's look at some illustrations. Think about how quickly clothes get wrinkled. Well, I never take them out of the dryer. <laughs> so they're wrinkled. I mean, they just immediately start to wrinkle. Who laundry is my favorite. It's my least favorite try. I hate it so much. Um, when you, gotta do, when you still have laundry sitting in the basket and your kids are out of underwear, so you got to redo laundry and just add it to the basket. Like, that's my life with laundry. Everything else, amazing. Laundry, worst. Um, but as soon as you put on clothes, they start to wrinkle. As soon as you, because you sit down or you move around, as soon as you put them on, they start to wrinkle. Uh, there, we used to know a guy. Have you ever seen somebody who showed up somewhere and they didn't have any wrinkles? We knew a guy. Some of you guys might still know this guy, Pastor Vic. He was amazing. He's an amazing guy. But he loved starch, and he loved ironing. And so, like, he came, he was crisp. You know, not crispy, but, like, crisp. And in order for him to get, he lived in Lathrop. So to get from Lathrop to Lodi without any wrinkles, you know he worked hard for that. Like, he held the seatbelt away from him, and he, when he sat down, he, like, pressed his clothes and pulled them out. You know, like, he worked hard to stay wrinkle-free. But what I want to do is I want to relate the obstacles we face to good testing with wrinkly clothes. 
Jesus, he's the renowned teacher in almost every religion, whether or not a religion acknowledges Jesus Christ as the Savior, the Son of God, they believe, almost all of them believe that he was a great teacher. He was a great prophet, great teacher. And he always taught using stories. He, he, they called them parables. And he took stories and he related them to modern day life so that we could get the picture. And so we're going to do that today uh, with wrinkles. Now, some, so here's, here's kind of three, three things I was thinking of. It's kind of good testing and wrinkles. Some people, the first one is some people don't care. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Some people don't care. I don't care about wrinkles. I'm, you, anybody else? Yeah. Okay, you don't care about wrinkles. Like, or you know somebody who doesn't care about wrinkles. For me, it goes even further. I don't care about fashion. Like, I'm one of those. I just, I don't care. I'm going to buy what I like if it feels good, whatever. Um, okay, some people take their time you know, picking out what they're, sometimes I do. Okay, that's fair. Sometimes I, I take my time figuring out what I'm going to wear. But others of you, you just look across the room and see which pair of pants still has the belt in it. And you're like, yep, yeah, I got my outfit picked out for the day. Same clothes that are halfway ready for me. Uh, some people just don't, they just don't care. Um, I'm, I'm the one who, when, if I know, if I notice wrinkles, because I feel like maybe I should, like, uh, that's a little too wrinkly. Uh, I throw it in the dryer. You know, I, the, the, the 10 minute in the dryer check, I throw it in there 10 minutes, and then like that's as good as it's gonna be. Like, it's, it's, it's like halfway wrinkly, but it's not all the way. That's, that's it. So some people just don't care. They don't care about doing well on tests. They don't care about wrinkles. They just, they're going through life and they just don't care. And then there's others, write this one down, some don't see. I don't know how you don't see wrinkles because they're there. Uh, but some, some don't see. Let's think about this in, in ways of life. Sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And so we, we can't see things because they've always been there. And if it's always been there I, and I have never seen it differently, then I don't, I don't know that's a wrinkle. I don't know that can be removed. I didn't know that could be different. I want to take a minute and just stop right there and like plug life groups for a second. Because a lot of us, you know, we grew up in the lives we knew we grew up in our families, we grew up in our cultures. But when we get around other people who have a different perspective than us, it helps us to see. And some of us, we need to see some things because God wants to do some things. But until we see them and we can acknowledge them and we can recognize, hey, that can be pressed out, that can be moved out, then we can't move into to other things. And so if you haven't joined a life group yet, we have a life group training. It's happening today and also next week. And it's going to be like 45 minutes. Just stick around the service. If you want to find out more about life groups, you want to be involved in a life group, any of that, just stick around and go through it because we need some friends who can tell us some things. Let's think about this. I can't take a rebuke from somebody or a correction from somebody unless I know that that person loves me. Has anybody ever tried to correct you and you had no relationship with them and it just soured you? Who for that person, for that situation, like, man. <clears throat> but how many of us know we need some correction? You know, sometimes you got a booger in your nose. I need to know that you love me before you tell me there's a booger in my nose. Or that I've got an anger issue. If I don't believe you love me, I can't receive that from you. But we need it, you know? You got green stuff in your teeth, man. Like, <laughs> we need some people in our life. And so get, get in a life group. Go through the life group training. Find out more about that. And just find out how you can get some more connection. Okay, some people don't see. The next one is that some don't know. Write this down. Some don't know what to do. So it's not that they don't care because they do care, and it's not that they don't see, because they can see, they're just not sure what to do. I don't know what to do about this situation. I don't know how to get through this. I don't know what the right answer is. You know, if you're taking a test, you can just go C all the way down, or A, B, C, and then make like some kind of zigzag. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, and I, I would say that at some point in our lives, maybe not with every situation, but in certain seasons and dips and ups and downs and mountains and valleys, we'll probably find ourselves in one of these categories at some place in life. Sometimes we don't care. Sometimes we, we just didn't see. Sometimes we do see and we do care, but we just don't know what to do. We haven't learned that yet. And so let's look at uh, some laundry. So this is my actual clothes. Can you see how wrinkly it is? It is actually wrinkly. Now, here's the deal. You can't just, when you're trying to get wrinkles out, you can't just like, I wish you could do this. Just like rub your hand down and like, oh, it's wrinkle-free. Once upon a time, uh, no, what you have to do is you have to, you have to take it, you actually have to take it off the hanger, right? <clears throat> 
And then, guys, well, I should open it up. <laughs> Actually, okay. So once upon a time at the beginning of our marriage, I don't even know if you remember this, husband. Um, <laughs> we lived on Cherry Street. So we had been married for like a year. And you had this great idea. It was so, you were like, wouldn't it be awesome if you did my laundry? <laughs> And you, you, it was like this great idea of me being able to iron your shirts. And once upon a time, I was a doting wife. And I thought, sure, yeah, I'd love to do that for you. <laughs> I got halfway through one shirt. And I said, this is no. I'm not doing this. This is no. This ironing board is Elliot's. Elliot came into the marriage with an ironing board. It's not mine. <laughs> because I don't care about wrinkles. This is Elliot's iron. Elliot came into the marriage with an iron and an ironing board. We never use it. But we have it. Okay, but if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna get out some wrinkles, you know what you gotta do? You gotta take it off the hanger and then you gotta lay it down. Does that remind you of a scripture? One where David says, You make me lie down in green pastures. Okay, we gotta lay the shirt down. And then once you lay the shirt down, the only time I ever got burned really bad, I was a kid and I went like this to make sure the iron was hot. <laughs> okay, if it was plugged in, which it's not. Uh, you would, you're really hot iron. What you got to do is you got to apply some heat. First, first is heat. Okay, so then you rub it. But not only heat, sometimes you got to press down a little bit. You got you to apply some pressure. And then if you're, you know, really next level, you got one with water in it. And you, 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 you turn on the steam. You push the button and the steam comes out. And you've got heat. You've got pressure, and you've got steam. And then after you work at it for a while, you, you can't just do the front of your shirt, although you could if you're a man and you wear a jacket, you just iron the front. <laughs> and then you put your jacket on, and nobody knows that you got wrinkles in the back because you only care what you look like up here, right? Not all over. Um, I'm a woman, and I don't wear jackets. Okay, and then so you got to do one side, and if you care about the whole thing, you got to do all the sides. It takes time. It takes time, and it takes heat and pressure, and steam. And then, you know, when you're done, it looks, this is fake, it looks somewhat good. But you know what? What really, who knows all the tips and tricks, is the dry cleaners. <laughs> this is my stepdad shirt. Let me borrow it. Look at how, look at how pressed that is. It has absolutely zero wrinkles. It's so, it's not shiny, but it's shiny. You know, like that shirt looks good. You're going to be Pastor Vic and you're going to get in the car and you're going to, you know, hold the seat. You worked, you paid for this. You worked hard for this. The dry cleaners, they know all the tips and the tricks. They know how to get out every stain, every wrinkle, every blemish, the dry cleaners. Let's check out a scripture. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. It says this, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. I'm not talking to husbands right now. What I want to focus on is as Christ loved the church. Who's the church? You are. We are. We are the church. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her, that's you, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless without stain or wrinkle. How you got to get the stains and the wrinkles out? Heat, pressure, steam. You got to make it lay down and you got to work out those wrinkles. Guys, what's Jesus doing with his church? He's pressing out every wrinkle. He's pressing out, you don't press out a stain. He, he'll set a stain if you buy heat. You got to wash that out. You got to, he, guys, God is the professional. He knows how to iron out every wrinkle. And he wants to iron out every wrinkle in our lives. And he wants to clean out every spot. Why? Because he knows we can look like this. And it's not because he's mean. It's not because he doesn't care. The test, the dip, the trial. It's not because God doesn't care about you. He says, oh, no, son. Oh, no, daughter. You can look like this. And I made you to look like this. And I, you're going to feel good. You're going to be good. You're going to be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. Let me press those wrinkles out. Let me do it. I'm going I'm to bring the heat. Okay. 
So the secret sauce is knowing. Guys, we got to know that you, you got to know you have wrinkles. Some of you have wrinkles on your face. Some of us have wrinkles, uh, you know, other places. Some of us aren't there yet, but it's coming. You know, age happens to all of us. We got to know that we have wrinkles and we have spots. And those aren't a bad thing. Those are, but God is going to work them out. And so it's through the dip. It's through the, through the process. So I want to talk a little bit about the process. Everything in the world has a process. You guys like good coffee? there's a process for good coffee. I mean, you got to, the kind of fertilizer, the soil from the time you plant that coffee bean seed all the way until it grows and it's roasted and it's processed and it's shipped unless you do local. Um, Like there is a process to making good coffee. What about good organic fruits and vegetables? There's a process to good fruits and vegetables. There's a process to good exercise, to having that, that lean or strong, whatever physique you're looking for. There's a process to getting it. And let's think about when the fact that if you're trying to get fit and you, you get a coach or a trainer, do you think that they're mean when they say, work harder, lift 10 more pounds? Or your, t- <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> or your teacher, when your teacher says, hey, why don't you go back and rewrite that paragraph? Because I think you can do it. I think you can do better. I, I want to see a little bit more. Some of, some of you uh, might say, gosh, that teacher is so mean, or gosh, I hate my trainer, or gosh, I hate my coach. But most of the time, you know that that person sees a level of potential in you, and they're trying to help you reach it. They're trying to help you make it to that goal, to, to see you through to what you actually can do. They're, they're going to increase your endurance, increase your strength. And so let's talk about the process, guys, of making a cake. Are you ready for it? The process of making a cake. So this is flour. You guys ever made a cake before? You need some flour. So ingredient number one is that we're going to put some flour in the bowl, except for I'm not going to put the flour in the bowl. I'm going to eat the flour. Okay? Because when you make a cake, if you're to eat, like, I I want some cake. I'm going to go ahead and just, mm. (laughs) hmm. That tastes so good. (laughs) I love cake. It's the best. I'm not being see it, but I got, it's like stuck in my teeth. <laughs> I love cake. <laughs> How somehow worse than the flour? That burns. That burns us. <laughs> Eat a baking powder. <laughs> if I hurl, guys. <laughs> oh, it's foaming. <laughs> I love that you care. <laughs> okay. And then there's the oil, you know, because you need oil. Oh, no. oh, no. I at least rinse the flour out of my teeth. <laughs> that tastes bad. This can't be bad. It's sugar. <laughs> Actually, wait. Normally, you got to blend the wet ingredients. So. Yeah, and it's raw, so it goes right to you, you know, straight into the, It tastes so good. I'm so excited that I'm eating this cake right now. You wish you all had some. Sugar on its own is not that great, guys. And then, of course, you need some vanilla extract. That 
also burns us. <laughs> okay. Cake. There's a process to making good cake. You need all the ingredients. <clears throat> Guys, all the ingredients by themselves are disgusting. Yes. And they do weird things in your mouth, to your body, to your person. <laughs> but something incredible happens when you take all of these disgusting ingredients on their own and you put them together in a bowl and then you put them in the heat. When you put all of these foul ingredients together and you put them in, <laughs> they're foul, and you put them in the heat, then you get something incredible. It's like their molecular structures change and they meld together. And instead of having one, you know, 17 individual disgusting ingredients, they all came together to make this. But you know what had to happen? All of those disgusting ingredients had to stay in the heat until it was done. You guys know what happens if you take a cake out too early? <clears throat> it flattens. It doesn't look beautiful. It sinks back in on top of itself, and it becomes flat, and it doesn't really taste that great. Remember the scripture, let perseverance finish its work. Everybody say, stay in, stay in the heat. Stay in the heat. Stay in the heat. Just so you guys know, I bought enough cake for everybody. So after church, we got cheesecake, we got white cake, we got chocolate cake, we got carrot cake. <laughs> So stick around before you go to growth track and before you go to life group training, you need to get yourself a slice of cake and then you need to eat your cake while you go through your classes. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Romans 8.28 says this. This is Paul writing. So remember James wrote and he said that we needed to know some things. This is another guy writing to the same group of people, the same church. And he says this, Romans 8.28, and we know. Paul, what are you expecting us to know? James was expecting us to know something. Paul, what are you expecting us to know? In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So Paul is expecting the church, the bride of Christ, that's you guys, to know something. This is, this is what Paul said. If you kill me, I'll be with Christ. If you let me live, I'll live through Christ. If you put suffering on me, I will increase my reward with Christ. What do you do to a guy like Paul? Nothing. You can't kill him. I mean, you can, but who cares? He don't care. Like, I'm going to be with Jesus. You let him live. Okay, that's great. I'm going to go through more pain. I'm going to go through more trial. I'm going to go through more suffering. But you know what? I'm going to live through Christ. And it's going to be amazing because other people are going to see the Christ that I know. And more and more people are going to come to know the Christ that I know. And then if you put suffering on me, that's okay. My reward in heaven is going to be that much bigger. What can you, because he knew some things. He knew some things about the test. Sometimes tests come because the devil is tempting us. Jesus went through that. He, he was sent straight into the wilderness after he got baptized because the devil wanted to tempt him. Sometimes tests come because God wants you to be perfected. You have some wrinkles and he wants to press them out. And so sometimes the tests come. Other time, times the heat just gets turned up because you made a dumb decision. And we reap what we sow. So if we make a dumb decision, we get to reap the consequences of that. But you know what? Our God is faithful. And through the consequence, he says, that's okay. Let me press out some wrinkles. <laughs> let me go ahead and work that out of you. Um, so the question is, can you identify, if, if you feel like you're in a dip or you feel like you're in a test, you're in the valley, can you identify which one your test is? Is the test so that you can remember the words of your God and come out the other side like Jesus? Is the test because God wants you to be perfected? He's stirring up some things saying, son, daughter, you didn't see this before, but it's possible to have that worked out. And so I'm going to work that out in you. Or is it because you just made some poor decisions and, and you've come to a place where you're going to reap the consequences of that, but Jesus is there in the middle of that with you. Second Corinthians 4, 16, 17 says this. <clears throat> Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving. Everybody say achieving. achieving. Achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Guys, this is Paul again writing this. 
If you ever go read the New Testament, Paul's troubles were not light and they were not momentary. So he wasn't making light of hard things. I mean, Paul was thrown in prison. Paul was beaten. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul, like there was like riots and he was dragged outside the city. All kinds of crazy, insane, terrible things happened to Paul. And he calls them light and momentary. It is not because they were light and momentary, but it's because he knew some things. These light and momentary troubles are nothing compared to what God is doing and can do with me if I keep my eyes on him and I move through the dip. Amen? Amen. So now with all this knowledge of what God wants to do in the dip, you can say, bring the heat. heat. Say it again. Bring the heat. I want to bring our attention to Peter for just a minute. Peter was called by Jesus. We looked at James. We looked at Paul. I want to look at Peter. Peter was called by Jesus and he spent three years walking with him. And Peter, when, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter was the one, he, he said who they think, you know, some say you're John the Baptist, others say yada, yada. And then Jesus looks at them and says, but who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of God. So before Jesus is crucified, before Jesus is resurrected, Peter's walking with Jesus and he begins to see some things and Peter begins to believe in Jesus and who Jesus is before he can see the full picture. Okay. Peter walked with Jesus. Peter believed Jesus. Peter gave up. Peter had a family. Peter had a wife and he had a, he had a family and he, he invested a lot of time with Jesus and these other disciples. Peter sacrificed some things to walk with Jesus and to learn some things from him. And before um, Jesus was crucified, so P- Peter, Peter loved him. And before Jesus was crucified, you guys remember the story that there, B- Jesus is taken away in the middle of the night and he's at the temple and Peter's in the courtyard and he's watching from the outside. And Jesus watches Peter deny him three times. Peter loved Jesus. Peter believed Jesus was the son of God. When push came to shove and Peter started to enter a dip, he said, no, I don't know that guy. No, I'm not one of them. No, I'm not, no, I'm not with him. And then the rooster crowed. And as soon as the rooster crowed, it says that Jesus looked at Peter. And the incredible thing about this is that, well, let's keep going. Peter felt like a failure. Anybody, have you guys ever felt like a failure? Like you let Jesus down or you just, or you let somebody else down? Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? He, but he, he did betray his friend. Peter In Jesus' darkest moment, Peter wasn't there for him after he said he would be. (laughs) I'll I'll be with you to the end, you know, ride or die. (laughs) Got really tough, and Peter wasn't there. Peter betrayed, I'm not going to ask you if you've betrayed a friend. Um, Peter also watched another guy. There was another guy, Judas, who had walked with Jesus for three years. And Judas is the one who, for 30 pieces of silver, sold Jesus. And that's how he came and got captured. And then Judas, as soon as he realized what he had done, like the weight of that moment hit him, he, he turned the money back in, and then he went and he hung himself in a field. So Peter said, I'm your ride or die. I'll be with you to the end. And he denied his friend three times in his deepest place of need. And then after that, he turned and he watched this other guy who he'd spent the last three year, years with go and hang himself because he couldn't handle the sadness. He couldn't handle the decisions that he'd made. <clears throat> and then after Jesus was killed, Peter goes back to his old way of life. Peter, who said, Jesus, you're, you're the Christ, the Son of God. I'm going to give my whole life to you. This is my new life. My new life is walking with you. And as soon as Jesus was gone, Peter went straight back. He went back to fishing. He went back to what he knew. He went into a dip. Luke 22, 31 through 32 says this. It's Jesus talking to Peter. This is, he calls him Simon. His original name was Simon, and then he was changed to Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you not just Peter, but each of you, all the disciples, like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. This is incredible because before any of the things I just mentioned happened, before Peter denied Jesus, before Judas hung himself, before Peter went back into his old way of life, Jesus said this, Jesus knew Jesus talked to Peter before those things happened. Jesus 
said these things to Peter before Peter entered the dip. Have you ever, this, have you ever had someone say they're going to be praying for you and then wonder if they are? Yep. When Jesus says he's praying for you, he's praying for you. Because if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he says he's praying for, for these people, he's praying for us. And the other thing is, is that God is not a man that he should lie, and Jesus is the Son of God. They're one and the same, and so Jesus cannot tell a lie. If Jesus says, I'm praying for you, you better believe Jesus is praying for you. If Jesus is praying for you, do you think you're going to get out of the dip? Yes, totally possible. <clears throat> and he says this. He says, your faith will falter. You guys ever been to a place where you feel like, man, my faith is being tested? And I'm having a hard time believing that this God, that Jesus is the son of God like I thought he was. Peter was right there with you. You're not the only one. Peter's, Peter's been through it. Peter's learned some things. So if you feel like that, you need to go get with Peter. Pick up your Bible and spend time with Peter and see, man, Peter, what did you learn? How did you do this? What did Jesus say to you? Jesus says, it, you, your faith will falter, but it will not fail because I am praying for you, says Jesus. You, and then he says, you will be restored. You will be renewed. And when you come back, you will turn around and you will strengthen the others. So when Peter, you can read this at the end of John, when Peter saw Jesus again, Jesus did restore him. He did exactly that. Jesus renewed him. Jesus affirmed and renewed his calling. And then Peter went on to be one of the greatest leaders of the early church. He wrote two of the books in the New Testament, First and Second Peter. And that's the grace of God. But Peter had to learn some things in the dip. Amen? Those were some hard things, hard things Peter had to learn in the dip. Peter didn't just come, when we read the scripture, Peter didn't just come out amazing. <laughs> Paul didn't come out amazing. Like they, they weren't just amazing people. They went through dips. They went through hard times. Think about Jesus. As soon as he was baptized, the devil, oh, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then immediately he was sent into the wilderness for 40 days. He had nothing to eat and he was tempted by the devil. He went through the dip. Paul, he, you know, he is on his way to Damascus. He gets blinded for three days. And then Ananias comes and prays for him. Some of my scales fall off of his eyes. All of a sudden he can see, he hears the word of the Lord that you're going to be my witness to the, the Gentiles. And then Peter, Paul spends three years in caves. He doesn't just go be amazing. He had to go spend three years in caves, learning some things, unlearning some things. He went into a dip. And on the other side of the dip, we see, we see mature, complete, not lacking anything, disciples and followers of Jesus. We typically want God to take us out of the test. And God says, no, I need you to stay there because I'm going to press some things out of you. Because I want you spotless and I want you wrinkle free. I want you mature, complete, and not lacking anything. So stay in the heat. Stay in the heat. Maybe you look back and you see failure. If you look back in your life and you see, gosh, I was in that test and I asked God to take me out of it, I just quit or I sat down or I just <laughs> sidestep the dip. You know, you can look back and you see that, that, was, that was a place where the Lord wanted to do some things with me and I backed out. This is not the end. This is not the end. If you are not dead, God's not dead. If you're not dead, God's not done. So what is the dip teaching you right now? Let's just apply this. What's the dip teaching you right now? First of all, the, the dip is not about the length of time you spend there. You guys, I don't know. I personally don't know anybody like this. But you guys know people who they have skipped grades? They're so smart they skipped grades. <laughs> I was one of those. They're not, they didn't skip the, they didn't skip the test. Why did they skip the grade? They learned some stuff faster. They learned quicker. They learned and applied more quickly and they were able to pass tests. And so it's not the length of the time. God's not keeping you in an internal testing zone. <laughs> but he's saying the quicker you learn things in the dip, the quicker you get out. The quicker you, you master this test, the quicker you get out. And so let's, let's apl you know, apply ourselves to learning some things. So number one, you can write this down, embrace the process. Embrace the process. All the, all the yucky things come together to do something good. Um, that's Romans 5, 3 and 5. Not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know Again, we know, we know some things. We know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If you guys want hope, you need character. And character doesn't come without perseverance, and perseverance doesn't come without a test. 
<laughs> so if you want hope, you got to go through the process. Test, perseverance, character, hope. Hang on. Hang in there. Number two, trust the Savior. Trust the Savior. Romans 8, 28. We already saw this scripture. And we know the benefit of knowing. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Guys, I want to just one, for one second, correct some, some faulty thinking that we have. We, we, we like to say things like this, things will work out in the end. No, they won't. For some people, it doesn't end well. These are people looking for hope, but misquoting scripture and hanging on to faulty promises. If you want real life, you got to hold on to the real promise. And the real promise is for those who love God. It will work out. We got to trust the Savior for those who love him. There's, there's another one. God won't give you more than you can bear. False. God won't give you more than you can handle. Lie. Lie. This is a misquote, probably a... 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it's not going to go up on the screens, but this is what the scripture says. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Does he say he will not give you more than you can handle? No. He says no temptation will be more than you can bear. So he will give you more than you can bear. He will give you more than you can handle because he's got to press some things out. But when we trust the Savior and we love God, then things begin to work out. So I'm going to challenge you guys. You're, I believe all of you read the scripture all the time and you're so amazing. But your devotional life has got to be more than quotes that you're seeing on social media. Because we're not holding on to faulty promises. We're holding on to true promises. And the true promises of God, I'm going to get in the word. And I'm going to find out where in the world does it say that? Because if it says that, I'll hang on to it. If it doesn't, then teach me the real promise. Because that's going to work the things out in my life. And that's what I want. Read it. 15 minutes or more can save you 15% on your car insurance. <laughs> Geico? Anybody? We need that. Gecko? How about 15 minutes a day and the word can save you from a lifetime of poor decisions Amen. and increase your stamina to endure and overcome the things in this life? First 15, let's get in the word, people. Uh, and then Psalm 55, 22 says this, give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. That reminds me of something we read in the New Testament. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. So will he permit the ungodly to slip and fall? What's the promise? Trust the Savior. Love God. Okay, if you feel like you are slipping and falling, turn back. That's what he said to Peter. When your faith is being tested, when you turn back and you put your eyes on me, you will be renewed. You will be restored. That's the promise. If you feel like you're slipping, if you feel like you're faltering, if you feel like you're failing, that's fine. But turn and look at Jesus. Open the word or write some things down and say, God, this is how I feel, but I'm looking right at you and what do you say? He will restore you. He will renew you. And then number three, music team, you can go ahead and come back up. But the last way we can apply this is look ahead to see how you will be able to help others. Look ahead to see how you will be able to help others. Again, Luke twenty two thirty two. 32, Jesus says, I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. God is at work, people. God's at work, church. And when you're going through something, you don't want to talk to somebody who's never been through it before. You don't. Because when, you, when you're going through something, you want to find somebody who's been through that same situation or a similar situation so you can say, tell me what you learned. Amen. Yep. How did you do that? What, you don't want to talk to somebody who's never been through it because you feel like they're not going to understand they're not going to know. Can I say get in a life group? Because if you're going through something and you don't know somebody who's been through it, it's going to be really hard to make. You're going to be there for longer than you should. You get in a life group, you get to know people that you just didn't know before. You begin to see some things that you didn't see before. All of a sudden, you got a new relationship. You got a new point of connection where you can get some stuff out and you can get some healing. You can turn your eyes to Jesus and he can renew you and he can restore you. You want to talk to some people who've been through it. Guys, if you've been through the dip, you've been through some things. And God wants to use that. It says we, we go through things so that we can turn around and have compassion on other people. I need to have compassion for other people so we can work people through. The, how many of you guys believe the world is 
in some desperate need of tutors. Right now, tutors, people who've been through it, who have learned some things and can teach other people how to do it. People who have made it through. Now, the tests are not to harm you, but to complete you and to strengthen you. And God wants to use you. There are people, you guys know, everywhere in the world, there are people who are ravaged by hardship. You, your own self, have been ravaged by hardship or are being ravaged by hardship, and you need some tutors. You need some people who've been through it, who will go into the dip with you and then bring you, they'll walk out. They'll walk out side by side. Let's go ahead and, um, if you guys would just close your eyes and bow your heads, we're just going to take a moment to pray. Father, I thank you for the process. I thank you for your, your word that says, Jesus, he's the bride of Christ, and he's working to remove every spot and every wrinkle. And it's not because he thinks we're ugly. It's because he thinks we're beautiful. And because he knows there's potential. And so, Father, I thank you for that word. Lord, and I ask that you would bring restored hope to your people, to your church. Lord, that if they've seen themselves as too ugly or too wrinkly, if they've seen themselves as too broken or too far from you, or like it's been too hard and so they've just checked out, Jesus, would you restore hope? Jesus, would you bring life and resurrection? Jesus, would you minister to them the fact that they are loved? They are, they are holy and dearly loved and they are set apart for work that you are doing. Would you begin to restore hope in this place? Father, would you, would you begin to minister to them about their future and the place where they are going because you're working out some things? Father, in the middle of the pressing, in the middle of the heat, in the middle of the oven, Jesus, would you increase their strength? Father, would you remind them of the fact that Jesus himself is praying for us? And if Jesus is praying for us, there's nothing in the world that can stop us. Church, with your, with your eyes closed, I just want to give a minute. If you feel like you're far from God, you, maybe you're one of those people who went through a test and you still believe God's real, but you're so far from him, you don't know what to do. It's not that you don't care. It's not that you don't see. You do see, you do care. You just don't know what to do. And what you want to do is you want to put your faith back in Jesus. You want to turn and say, okay, I need to be renewed. I need to be restored. If that's you, just go ahead and lift your hand up in the air. Amen, I see your hand, amen, I see your hand, amen, 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 amen. God is so good, amen. Every amen is a yes, people, people looking at Jesus and saying, I want to be restored, I want to be renewed, amen. Go ahead and just repeat this after me if you would. Father, thank you for your son. I thank you for the process. I receive your love. I repent of my sin. And I ask you to fill me. I believe you're the Savior. And I believe in your process. Fill me with your spirit. And lead me to do what's right. Amen. Let's celebrate. God is good and it's almost time for cake. My mouth still tastes like baking soda and salt. So I'm so excited for a piece of cake. Ah, guys, I, what, um, I would hate for you guys to, I'm not a baseball player, but we like to say don't hit a home run and then not run the bases because that would be a waste of your time. Uh, so here, here's, here's what it is. If you're newish here or you made a decision today or you want to join a life group, you want to go through the growth trap, take that step today. And if you're not sure, you want to take the step, but you're not sure, like, oh, maybe not today, I had plans, grab a connection card out of the seat back in front of you, write your name, your email address, your phone number on it, and then you can either check the box, I want to go through growth track, I want to join a life group, or you can write your question. If your question isn't on there, just go ahead and write it on there, and you can turn it into the, the box on the back wall, and we'll get in touch with you. We'll let you know about the, uh, the next training or the next class so you can make plans to do that. But it is happening today right after service. So like I said, get yourself a piece of cake and then go through the live group training or go through a growth track. We'd love to have you be a part of that with us. And then the next thing is giving. If you are belong to, to Lifeline Church and 
then you probably already know the ways to give. But if you're new to coming here and you want to be a part of what the Lord is doing and you want to just, we believe in the scripture. We're 100% a Bible-believing church. And the, the scripture says that when we bring our tithe to the storehouse, that first 10% of our income, he's so faithful to bless the other 90%. And he says, you can do more with the 90% than you could with the 100. And so if you want to walk into that blessing, that provision, uh, then we want to make that available to you. There's lots of ways you can do that. You can text to the number on the screen, just the dollar amount. The Church Center app, if you know how to use the QR code, just pull out your camera right now and point it at the screen, and then it'll take you to the giving link, the Church Center app. And then you can also do that with the giving envelopes. If you have cash or check, you can fill it in and drop it in. Um, and then if you want more information on that, talk to someone wearing a Dream Team badge. They'd love to help you and get you set up with that. Now, um, invite somebody to church, guys. Let's be bringing church next week. We're gonna, we're gonna keep going in our Don't Quit in the Dip series. And so if you know somebody or this has been blessing you, bring someone with you. We have the invite cards on the seat. Just grab one. Or if you don't wanna use the invite card, that's fine. Just bring a friend, a family member, someone you have a relationship with. Say, hey, come to church with me next week. All right, go ahead and stand up. I just wanna give you a blessing before I release you to eat cake. I'm telling you to eat cake because I bought cake. You gotta eat the cake. Cake before lunch today. It's backwards day. It's gonna be just fine. Uh, if you're ready, go ahead and uh, just open up your hands like you're ready to receive a gift from Jesus because he wants to give some things to you. Father, I bless your church. This is the bride of Jesus. These are your people, and you love them. Father, and you see every need. You see every space. You see into the deepest places of their heart. You see into their future. You see into their dreams. Lord, and so would you increase their ability to hear from you? Would you increase their ability to trust you? Would you increase their ability to have joy that is found in you? Would you bless your church and make your face to shine upon them? Would you minister your healing? Would you increase their faith? Lord, and may they be a light in the dark places where they go. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Church, be blessed. Get some cake. <laughs>